Hello everyone. Welcome to the Clue Audio Commentary. My name is John Hatch. I'm the author of What Do You Mean Murder? Clue and the Making of a Cult Classic. It's available for pre-order now on ebook and in the very near future you will be able to order it on audiobook and also hard copies from wherever you like to get your books. I'm going to be going through Clue with you today. Make sure you have the movie queued up, but don't start it yet. We want to be on the same page, so get to the Paramount Mountain just as the stars start to appear around it. Hit pause, and then we will count down and begin. I'm going to be going over a lot in the movie. One quick thing about Clue, we see almost everything in the first 10 minutes. We see almost every character we see every location except maybe the upstairs and the downstairs so there's a lot to cover if i skip something at the beginning just know that i'm going to come right back to it later and we're going to try and cram in as much as we can in the hour and a half or so that we have with that let's get started with your movie queued up to the paramount logo with the stars around it on the count of three Hit play with me, and we will go. One, two, three. These opening credits were not what Jonathan Lynn originally wanted to do. The production actually took footage of actor Kelly Nakahara in the kitchen. She was making dinner and making a chocolate cake, for example. There's even a production still of her that you can find on the internet if you go look for it sitting down smoking a cigarette, and fans have thought, well, is this like a candid photo in between shots? It's not. It was actually part of what they originally envisioned and filmed for these opening credits. They also interspersed a lot of footage of the McCarthy hearings, the Army McCarthy hearings from June 1954 to really set the stage. But probably in editing, Jonathan Lynn, the director, decided that he wanted something a lot more ominous. Paramount told him no, there was no money, and so he found these clouds, and that's what he went with. These clouds are stock footage, and then he put the remaining credits over Wadsworth's car. When we see Wadsworth's car in just a moment, this is in Franklin Canyon in Los Angeles on Franklin Canyon Drive. Wadsworth's car is driven by a stunt man who's going up the road here it kind of can feel like wadsworth's driving for a while but really we just have these two very brief shots and then here we have this second shot as it fades in to him approaching these gates now these gates were constructed by the production team in franklin canyon drive these are not the gates that a lot of fans think of as being out in front of the house that we're going to talk about in just a minute in pasadena Wadsworth's car makes its way here from Franklin Canyon Drive into Pasadena. And here we are. This is a home that was in Pasadena. The home itself, the Bush Mansion, doesn't appear on screen. Instead, they used a map painting that we'll talk about in just a moment. But they used the driveway. They used the top of the house here. Those gargoyles that we just saw were actually built by the production team. They weren't part of the house. And now... We're on the Paramount lot. Like I say, things go quickly here at the beginning. The house that we saw a moment ago was a map painting done by Sid Dutton and Albert Whitlock and Bill Taylor. Albert Whitlock had done a lot of work with Alfred Hitchcock, and he came out of retirement to help on Clue. Here we are on Paramount Stage 18. This includes these outdoor, put outdoor in quotes, shots. This was all on stage 18, the entire mansion and this front porch and driveway. Notice, by the way, really quickly, that Wadsworth and the dogs never appear in the same shot together. The dogs were temperamental. They were giving Jonathan Lynn quite a headache. They were some of the first things filmed in the movie, and they were the last things filmed on the last day of shooting. This right here with Wadsworth showing up and then the infamous dog poop joke, this was filmed on May 20th. That was the first day of filming. And the last day of filming was August 12th, 1985. 
that's when they shot the last footage of the dogs. Now, it's often said that Clue was filmed in continuity, meaning they filmed everything in order that the movie appears. That's not quite true. It's close to true. They were able to get all the actors contracted for the whole shoot, and it made things a lot easier. And again, of course, with everything being filmed in Los Angeles and almost everything filmed at the Paramount lot, it made it a lot easier. They didn't have to worry about location shoots as much or anything like that. But there were times when they did film things out of order, especially things like the flashbacks later in the movie to show how a murder was committed. But even other things like the footage of Wadsworth earlier scraping his feet was shot a month after this. And then when it cuts to the wider shot of him entering the house, that was filmed on May 21st, 1985. So it wasn't quite strictly in continuity. This is Kelly Nakahara, most famous for M.A.S.H. This was her first movie where she was alive just for a few moments. She played a corpse most of the time. These were mostly not dummies. The corpses were actually the actors playing their character and they would be thrown around and she told she came home one day from the set and showed her children the bruises that she had from being thrown around and flung over the couch and she recreated it for them and jumped over the couch to her to her children's delight. Nakahara was watching part of the Army McCarthy hearings there. That was footage from June 9th, 1954. Very famous day when attorney Joseph Welch confronted Joseph McCarthy and very famously said, at long last, sir, have you no sense of decency? That footage was probably taken because it's the most famous day of the hearings. Clue fans have said, well, that means that this takes place on June 9th, 1954. And that's a fun little bit of trivia, but I think it's much more likely that that footage appears because that was the easiest footage to find. Other things don't correspond to the June 9th date. There were no thunderstorms really of any kind anywhere in New England, and there was no full moon that we'll see later to say that this was June 9th. We've had Colonel Mustard arrive. It's been shown that he might know a vet. And here, when Mrs. White arrives, we see that she definitely knows Yvette. And that'll, of course, become important later. I want you to notice, too, in the library that everybody is offered champagne. And they're all drinking champagne. That will be very important later in the deleted fourth ending that has become legendary among fans. We're going to go over that ending and explain exactly what happened and why it was cut. Here we have Leslie Ann Warren peering over her car. Leslie Ann Warren played Miss Scarlet much more aggressively than she is in the script. This moment, for example, in the script says that she's supposed to be kind of intimidated and a little scared that Professor Plum is showing up, wondering if she's in danger. Leslie Ann Warren completely throws this out and it makes it clear that she's using Plum to get a ride and she's not cowed by him at all. I think Warren's performance might be the best in the movie as much as people love Tim Curry's and also Madeline Kahn's, but Warren really, really outdid herself in this role. Fans over the years have noticed, and now we have the internet with lots of fan sites and movie trivia, that point out that the cars match the color of the token in the game. Jonathan Lynn very deliberately did not put the characters in the same color as their game tokens. He didn't want those kind of callouts to the game. He really believed the movie had to work on its own. And he felt like it would be taking away from the movie, really, if, if you put everyone in and kind of wink and nod at them. Oh, hey, remember this from the game? He didn't want to do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit with the weapons as well. That, that informed what weapons were used in the movie. Here we have Michael McKean. He had just starred in Spinal Tap just a year before Clue, and he was getting pretty popular. Spinal Tap didn't take off either when it first appeared. It didn't take as long as Clue did to become a classic, but it wasn't it wasn't very popular at first, and now, of course, it, it is also a beloved comedy classic. When Scarlett mentions Route 41, that's left over from John Landis' original idea of having the movie take place in Florida. This shot of the house with the lightning that we just saw again was done by 
Bill Taylor and Sid Dutton. They worked on that for a few months at the end of principal photography to get the light, lighting just right and the lightning strike just right. Taylor and Dutton didn't work on Clue for three straight months. They would jump around to other projects, but they did work on it from September to October and even into November 1985. Again, remember, we're on stage 18 here in Paramount. This rain coming down is all simulated by the production. This was not outside. They didn't wait for the rain. That's just not how movies work. And so all of this is indoors. There was some concern that they might actually flood below the stage where there was a storage area. And so they were very, very careful not to do that. And of course, it didn't happen. Now, in the script, this moment doesn't happen. And in fact, they chose to film that insert shot of Professor Plum groping Miss Scarlet about a month after this. They hadn't originally anticipated it. And at some point, Jonathan Lynn or perhaps Leslie Ann Warren or Christopher Lloyd or all three decided, well, we should, we should do this. We should make him really lecherous here and show that she's not going to put up with it. And it works quite well. All of the rooms were constructed on stage 18 except the ballroom, and we'll talk about that. This was built by the production team. The set cost about $1 million, and that was something Paramount trumpeted quite a bit in its marketing materials. They made a big deal of that. If you notice here, the cook is running away very quickly. And you'll also notice that Mrs. Peacock is one of the last people to leave the room. This was why she got the drink spilled on her. This was all crafted by Jonathan Lynn in his screenplay because Mrs. Peacock isn't supposed to see the cook because that's a big plot point. Now, I am going to mention that later on, other characters, that kind of care isn't really taken to them and their informer. When the motorist shows up, Wadsworth makes no attempt to hide him from Colonel Mustard and likewise with the cop and Miss Scarlet. I'm not really sure why, but it may just be that as time went on and Jonathan Lynn wrote the screenplay, it became very tiring and very difficult to try and tie all of those threads together. But he did make that point with Mrs. Peacock and the cook. And you'll see that here in just a moment when the kitchen hatch flies open and startles everybody. And Wadsworth steps in front of it to hide the cook from Mrs. Peacock. It's not a coincidence, and it's not something that just randomly happened. Instead, it was written out in the screenplay. This dinner scene was filmed over four days at the end of May. They took a day off to recognize Memorial Day, and then they got back to it. Clue was relatively easy compared to a lot of productions. I don't want to minimize at all the work that was put in or the difficulty, especially for Jonathan Lynn, who as director and writer was really run ragged. But for the actors, they weren't really on location anywhere. They could all be staying. If they lived in the Los Angeles area, they could go home. And if they didn't like Madeline Kahn, they could stay at a hotel or at a rented home or something like that. And then they would arrive on set Around 8 a.m., they would get in their hair and makeup, and it didn't take very long. Keep in mind, again, that they're all wearing the same costumes the whole time. And we're going to get into why that is and how the movie unfolds. But they would show up, again, around 8 a.m., and they would take anywhere from an hour to, for most of the men, just about 30 minutes to get into costume and makeup and have their hair done. It wasn't too taxing for them and then they would film and then they would wrap up they got weekends off and they got holidays off compared to a lot of productions that's not too terrible again i don't want to underplay how hard they worked or the work that they put in there could be long days and the reality is working on a movie set can be really tedious michael mckean tells the famous now among fans story of shooting pool in the billiard room and while that's a fun story it kind of gets to how mundane things can get and there's a lot of waiting around while they reset lighting and switch things around to get a different shot or get ready for a new scene now, I mentioned just a minute ago that we were going to get into why the characters are all wearing the same costumes and everything like that. Now, it might seem obvious, but that's because we have the finished movie. 
When Clue was originally envisioned, it was envisioned as a stage play by producer Deborah Hill. She came up with the idea for this. She wrote a treatment in 1980, and it was very different than the movie we have now. But from its earliest incarnation, she saw it as a stage play. She flew to London a few times and met with authors there, stage writers, to come up with something, and she wanted to stage it as a play. And that means that, well... We want as few costume changes as possible. We don't have a ton of locations or anything like that. And if you step back and look at the movie today, it kind of feels a little bit like a play. Most of the action takes place in just a handful of rooms. We do glimpse every room, and that was part of Hill's original contract with Parker Brothers to get the rights to Clue. Every weapon had to be featured. Every room had to be featured, among some other stipulations, including that it be a family film. There wasn't really to be any profanity or any graphic violence in it, and that's how we have the movie we have today. But Hill in London, that's where she met John Landis and hired him probably around 1981, early the end of 1980 or early 1981, to write and direct Clue. Landis came up with what we see here, in the basic storyline. We know this because we have a transcript of that famous pitch he would give. Jonathan Lynn has talked a lot about this pitch that Landis gave where he's bouncing off the walls and making quite a fuss and jumping on the furniture and all of that. We actually have a transcript of that and we can see how much of this really came from John Landis. And the basic story outline did come from him. This was a lot of his idea and very different from Deborah Hill's. Throughout Hill's attempt to get Clue made from 1980 onward, she hired a lot of different writers. After Landis, he realized that once he had the story that he wasn't really a writer. He wasn't going to write a full screenplay and he wasn't sure how to end the movie. And so Hill went to a lot of different writers. One that she went to was a playwright, Warren Manzi. And Warren Manzi has written a play called Perfect Crime. And that's really what he's known for today. Manzi passed away. He was very young. He was only 60 years old. He died of pneumonia a few years ago. He wrote two screenplays for Clue. The first one resembles nothing (laughs) like this final movie. And he did his own thing. He did not use any of John Landis' ideas. It's a very different movie than you might expect about a group of guests coming to a mansion to sit down and have dinner and end up dealing with blackmail. Instead, Manzi used the clue game to kind of inform the mystery that was going on in the real world. For example... The main character in the movie is a mystery writer, and one day he receives in the mail three clue cards. He receives Colonel Mustard, and the wrench, and the library. And he has no idea what they mean. He just kind of tosses them aside and doesn't give it much thought. Well, that night, after he receives those cards, a Mr. James Mustard, who used to be a colonel in the army, goes to the New York Public Library for a meeting where he's murdered with You got it, a wrench. And that was Manzi's idea for the movie, that a serial killer was running around and he was using these clue cards to tip his hand. The screenplay was actually a homage to Agatha Christie's The ABC Murders. And you can, if you're familiar with that book, you can probably see where things would have gone. Manzi's screenplay was rejected and Deborah Hill had him go back to the drawing board. And for his second screenplay, he did rely more on John Landis's ideas and did come up with a mansion with these characters and a butler. The butler in that one is called Cleese because John Landis envisioned John Cleese as the butler. Whether or not they were going to really hire him, that's just kind of who he pictured. And so Warren Manzi wrote a second screenplay, and I won't go into the whole thing now, but again, it's not exactly like this movie. There is a mansion, the characters are there, but Manzi didn't write the four endings that John Landis envisioned. He also didn't stick to Parker Brothers' agreement that there really shouldn't be profanity or graphic violence. There's a lot of both and a sex scene that ends up being pretty integral to the plot that can't be cut. So Manzi was not hired, and instead they turned to another screenwriter, Tom Stoppard. Now, Tom Stoppard is very well known and very famous for his plays. He's won every award under the sun, and he got to work on Clue, but he also couldn't work it out. There is correspondence in his papers 
between him and John Landis, showing how all of this went down and the fact that he couldn't do it. Now, I'm going to pull away from the development of Clue for a minute to mention these dogs. Jonathan Lynn wrote three official screenplays of Clue. He wrote one that he labeled a first draft in May 1984. That's when that first one was done. But before even that one, there were two what I'll call preliminary drafts where he had sketched out his ideas and they were still pretty close to the final film. Then he wrote his second draft, which was very close to the first, and he was done with that in June 1984. Then he went on for another six months and he wrote the third draft and finished that in January 1985. Those first two drafts did not have those dogs at all. What Jonathan Lynn came up with was a mannequin standing outside of the conservatory holding a rifle. And Wadsworth points him out to Mr. Body and says, hey, you better watch yourself. There's, a, there's an armed guard out there with a gun. And that was his idea to be able to keep the guests trapped in the house. We have to have a way to keep these guests trapped in the house. Well, that's how it was. By the third draft, he came up with those dogs. And it was the head of uh, Paramount Production, Don Steele, who came up with the dog poop joke that Wadsworth steps in this and then everybody goes around sniffing. And Jonathan Lynn later said that he kind of regrets that joke and feels like it's a little bit out of sync with the rest of the movie. Here, Wadsworth's finally explaining to everyone what's going on. They've been dragged to this mansion. We're about 20 minutes into the movie at this point, and they're finally learning that they're all blackmail victims, and they're learning that Mr. Body is the one who's been blackmailing them, or they're about to find that out in just a moment. It was Jonathan Lynn who did come up with this angle. He's famously said that when he was hired to write Clue, he had no idea what to do because these aren't characters, they're tokens in a game, they're colors. And there's no reason for people named Colonel Mustard and Professor Plum to show up at a mansion together. So he's the one that came up with this idea that they might be aliases and the time period that John Landis had thought that Clue might take place in is a period piece in the 1950s. Jonathan Lynn realized, well, that's a really good time because of the McCarthy hearings and the Red Scare. There's a lot of paranoia going on, and that might work for a blackmail story. Jonathan Lynn really knows a lot about politics. He came to Clue because he had written a series in Britain called Yes Minister that to this day is fairly prominent and famous. The HBO series Veep was actually based on Yes Minister. This kind of cynical view of politics. Jonathan Lynn knows a lot about politics. He follows it closely. And he wrote Clue around that. It was toned down from his first draft. There was a lot more in the first draft of the McCarthy hearings, the Red Scare, a lot more paranoia, and a lot more fear among the characters. That was replaced by the third draft for a lot more slapstick and humor. Clue was always funny, but it became funnier by the third draft and some of that terror and paranoia was dropped and so was some of the what was really a pretty scathing commentary on the United States of America. Jonathan Lynn had been to the United States but he lived in London. He was born in Britain and even though he knew a lot about this country he hadn't really ever lived here for any extended period of time and when it came to write Clue this is what he came up with. A lot of really paranoid people, a lot of criticism of capitalism at any cost. And in the early drafts, there were some really scathing remarks about the United States and how hypocritical everyone is because they'll do anything for money but expect everyone to behave a certain way. It was pretty different than what ended up in the final movie, but we can still glimpse some of this criticism of U.S. politics. Let's take a look at some of the actors and the casting process for Clue. Here we have Madeline Kahn explaining how she discovered her husband dead at home. Madeline Kahn is probably the most different performer from any of the other people in Clue. A lot's been said about how everybody would get together and have so much fun and all of the actors had so much fun. Madeline Kahn was kind of the exception to that. She was so funny, she was so talented, and she is so beloved that it gives people the wrong idea about her. She was very private. She was very shy. She didn't really feel comfortable being funny, which is 
understandably very ironic when people hear it because she was so funny. She was the one that Leslie Ann Warren would say would often go off to her trailer in between scenes instead of hanging out and talking and joking around like the rest of the cast would. Madeline Kahn came to Clue after Leslie Ann Warren became Miss Scarlet. Leslie Ann Warren had been hired to be Mrs. White. Well, what happened? Carrie Fisher had been hired to play Miss Scarlet. She'd done well, and the producers really wanted her for the role. But she had to drop out after she went into rehab. Since Leslie Ann Warren was already cast, they shuffled her to the role of Miss Scarlet. And they offered Mrs. White to Madeline Kahn, who they'd already met with earlier for the role of Mrs. Peacock. I'm going to quickly point out some of the decor around the house. I mentioned earlier that Paramount made a big deal in their production materials of how much the set cost, that a lot of these props were antiques from the 18th and 19th century that they had recruited. And that is absolutely true, and Paramount played that up. But a lot of the props did just come from the prop department. A lot of the props weren't fancy things or anything. But one thing that set decorator Tommy Roysden wanted was kind of what he called an animalistic look for the set. And if you look around, you'll notice tons of animal decor all over. In fact, right there behind Mr. Body was a cobra lamp. If you look carefully at it, you can see there's this golden body of a cobra and then the upturned reverse lampshade. And around the lampshade is the tongue and mouth of a cobra. The one mystery about Clue I was never able to solve was the mystery of Lee Ving's voice. It's clearly been dubbed throughout here and almost certainly by another actor, but I could never find out who. Now, before we get back to the actors, these weapons. Fans online have done an amazing job of hunting down these weapons. Obviously, the lead pipe and the rope are lead pipe and rope. They're just generic. But the rest of the weapons actually were items, and you can still find them today if you're diligent enough. Again, Jonathan Lynn didn't want the production designing these elaborate weapons only for use in the movie. He wanted real things that Mr. Body might have found. That wrench is something you can go find. Uh, it's probably the easiest prop to find in the movie. It's a Billings Co's wrench. It's a particular size. You can go look it up online. Same with the dagger and the gun. That dagger is a Fairbane Sykes fighting dagger. It was designed for World War II, and a lot of soldiers used it during the war. Professor Plum's gun is a particular kind of gun that's a very difficult one to find because they did two models, one with a shorter barrel, and that one has a little bit longer barrel, and it can be very expensive to find, but it does not deter Clue fans from going out and looking. I'll talk later about the paintings, but for now, notice the decor around this room, especially the Roman busts of generals and the couches and everything else that Tommy Roisden and his team tried to come up with. Here we're in the study. The study is in some ways kind of the heart of Clue. No other room was featured as much and they spent a lot of time in here filming this scene and then all of the later scenes that take place in here. Clue was made for TV in a lot of ways. They didn't have to edit out any profanity. They did take one shot where Madeline Kahn had kneed Mr. Body in the groin, and they did a retake of that of her just punching him in the stomach in case they needed it for TV. It was really challenging, especially for a first-time director like Jonathan Lynn to shoot Clue, and he relied a lot on director of photography Victor Kemper to help him out. Shooting it was hard because of the ensemble nature of the film. You know, most movies have a lot of close-ups of the stars, but in this one, you'll notice there's a lot of two medium shots and full shots of all of the stars. I'm going to quickly jump back here and point out, as everyone gathers around Mr. Body and Professor Plum checks his pulse, that Wadsworth is nowhere to be seen. Keep that in mind again for the fourth ending. This fourth ending was always planned, it was filmed, it was edited. There was never any question that it was going to appear in the movie. 
If we look at the rest of the stars, we have Eileen Brennan as Mrs. Peacock. Brennan had just got out of rehab for a pain pill addiction. She was hit by a car a few years before Clue started filming, and it was a terrible accident. She actually was lucky to be alive. It, she took years to go through physical therapy, and before she shot Clue, she had only done a couple of TV episodes. Clue was her first movie back. And Christopher Lloyd would say in Adam Vary's wonderful oral history of Clue that appeared in BuzzFeed in 2013 that you could tell that Eileen Brennan was really trying hard and that she was in some pain. And in fact, right there where Mr. Green is supposed to slap her, they took great care to make sure that she was not actually hit. Obviously, because you just don't want to hit anybody, but also because of her accident. Brennan really elevated the role of Mrs. Peacock in the script. Mrs. Peacock, in a lot of ways, is the most unlikable character. She's prudish. She's arrogant. She's sort of this dame of society. And, and especially in the first draft of Clue, she might remind people who are familiar with Agatha Christie's book, and then there were none, of the character Emily Brent. Really aware and critical of everybody else's faults, but blind to her own. We did just see Eileen Brennan kind of sneak by the group. We may not have noticed it the first time we saw it, but once you're familiar with Clue and the endings, you pay attention to that sort of thing. There was actually footage shot this same day. Again, we're now into the beginning, middle of June of filming of Eileen Brennan sneaking by everyone and raising the dagger as she goes into the kitchen. That footage, that flashback footage that was supposed to be used at the end of the movie to show how she killed the cook went unused, obviously. Here we are in the billiard room. One of the trickiest things about filming Clue, in addition to the big ensemble, was the lighting. In here, in the billiard room, there was supposed to be only one light alongside that desk lamp, and it was supposed to be the light over the pool table. Well, with all of the dark wood, all of the dark drapes and the velvet and the carpets and everything else, lighting became a real challenge for a director of photography, Kemper, and for Jonathan Lynn. And it could take hours just to reset a shot and get the lighting right, especially in rooms like the study or the dining room that also had a fireplace that had chandeliers. They had to balance those huge studio lights against those things as well to get everything right. And it was very difficult. Let's talk about Tim Curry and how he came to Clue. Casting Wadsworth was pretty difficult. They went through several different people. They had the names of John Lithgow and Tim Conti as possibilities. Now, fans know that they had talked about Leonard Rossiter. That was someone that Jonathan Lynn thought of when he thought of Wadsworth, but Rossiter had died before they even began casting. Lynn also thought of Rowan Atkinson and even asked Atkinson to create a reel of his performances to send to Paramount. And Atkinson did so and Jonathan Lynn isn't even sure if they looked at it because they didn't really take Rowan Atkinson seriously because he wasn't very well known at the time in the United States. And so they ended up with Tim Curry. But in the cast list, you can look through names and names and names of everyone that the casting directors thought of and it's really a who's who of 80 stars and my favorite one that shows up as an idea for Wadsworth is Weird Al Yankovic. Now there's no indication that they met with Weird Al or that it went anything beyond just an idea but it was an idea at one point they had. Harry Anderson was a leading contender for Mr. Green but when producers met with him they felt like he wasn't right for the role. Christopher Lloyd appeared on the cast list early and under several different names. He was thought of as a possibility for Wadsworth, for Mr. Green, and for Professor Plum. And so he was someone they wanted right away. Christopher Lloyd had just finished filming Back to the Future when he auditioned and got the role in Clue around April, March and April of 1985. And so the Clue production team and the Clue producers really got a coup there and they didn't even know it at the time because Back to the Future would open in June of 1985 to these massive receipts 
and it would go on to be the biggest hit of the year and of course still a very beloved movie and a lot of notices a lot of reviews said that Lloyd's performance stole the show and in fact in December of 1985 after Clue opened there were a couple of weeks when Back to the Future still outperformed Clue at the box office six months after it had opened. Lloyd had also been in TV series and movies. A lot of the actors in Clue came along the same path. They started in the theater in the 70s or maybe the late 60s. They turned to television and then eventually to movies and they ended up in Clue. The two exceptions to that are Martin Mull and Leslie Ann Warren, two people who, since working on Clue together, have actually become pretty close friends, and they've starred in a lot of other things together, or at least appeared in a lot of other things together, like Community and, of course, the beloved Psych episode that pays homage to Clue. Martin Mull got his start actually doing comedy records. Mull is very different from a lot of his cast members. He thinks of himself, he once said, as 99% a painter. He's a very talented artist. He's had art shows across the country. And he got playing the guitar while he was going to school and he would go do gigs and he would do these comedy performances, but he said that he's not a great singer and so he would just have these long asides to the audience where he would talk to them and make jokes. And then he started releasing these comedy albums. It was in the 1970s when he started appearing on television. He was in the soap sitcom spoof, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and then he had Fernwood Tonight and America Tonight, and then he was in some movies in the early 80s, things like Mr. Mom and some other shows. Leslie Ann Warren got her start earlier than everyone, even though she's no older than them, but she got started at a very young age. She was most well-known as appearing in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella on television, and that was rebroadcast a few times and so audiences got to know her and then by the 1970s she was in a lot of tv series and also movies she'd won a lot of awards by the time she came to clue and was also a very very well-known actor the cast of clue really does stand out i mean it's easy to take for granted especially among fans if you're listening to this you're probably a pretty big fan of clue and you already know this that the cast is really wonderful but it's easy to take for granted these real comedic geniuses and what they were able to do together and again for me the women of Clue have always really stood out I mean Eileen Brennan, Madeline Kahn and Leslie Ann Warren and also Colleen Camp are really really something else now Colleen Camp came to Clue after seeing some of her roles diminish in movies she got her start after she did a bird show at Bush Gardens uh, in California. Someone saw her and got her into television commercials and then she did TV and she did some movies. She was a playgirl in Apocalypse Now, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and then she was in some other movies. But she spoke to reporters at the time she was cast in Clue and there's a little bit of a hint of defensiveness in her voice about playing this buxom maid I don't want to speak for her, of course, and say she was resentful, but she talked about how she had a hard time getting roles that didn't want her to just parade around in a bikini. Colleen Camp is an extremely intelligent and professional and talented actor, and there's probably no one in Hollywood she hasn't worked with. And so for her, I think at the time it was a little bit difficult to see that she wasn't able to get a lot of these roles because everyone just expected her to be sexy in a movie and she never understood why she couldn't be sexy and funny in a movie and she really had that chance in Clue and she embraced the role but in articles at the time she goes out of her way to just flat out tell reporters I'm not a bimbo um, I'm a serious person and it'd be nice if people would take me seriously here we see some of the evidence that uh, Wadsworth has gathered from Mr. Body's informers that will be used against the people for their blackmail. The production team actually did create this and later on when the, one, of the, one of the killers goes to dispose of it, that person could be one of any four people depending on the ending, we get a glimpse of that evidence and they, they created that around the Paramount lot. There's a shot of 
Mrs. Wyatt on a porch and Mr. Green coming out of the State Department. If you pause it just right, you can see that that's actually probably not Michael McKean and not Madeline Kahn. They may have used stand-ins for that. Because they were the most visible in these evidence photos, Martin Mull and Jeffrey Kramer were used. They got into some army uniforms and footage was taken of them on the Paramount back lot. This particular shot, Jonathan Lynn would later say, was a little bit tricky to get with Eileen Brennan. It might seem simple to all of us who just watch movies and really don't think much of it, but the timing there to get Eileen Brennan falling and the camera panning down, especially given that Brennan was injured, was a little bit tricky. Here, they had actually taken shots of the candlestick wobbling up above Wadsworth on the molding there and they used different shots. One of the shots had a lot of blood on the candlestick, and then another had no blood on the candlestick. And you can see there that there's no blood on the candlestick. They opted for no blood because they, again, didn't want to go too far with that. That was, of course, not the real candlestick that they used. That was a production-created candlestick so as not to injure Tim Curry. Now that we're back in the study, and they've dragged the cook across the ground, by the way, she was on a dolly there. One of the ironies of this for Kelly Nakahara's family is that she had actually just lost a lot of weight. She had done an episode of MASH that Alan Alda had specifically written for her, where Nurse Chaser Hawkeye Pierce, played by Alda, wants really nothing to do with Kelly other than to be her friend and he thinks she's terrific and all of that but he's not really interested in her romantically because of her physical appearance and he wrote this episode for her where she calls him out on that and has a wonderful speech telling him how great she is and that she sings and tap dances and she remained very proud of that episode until the end of her life she unfortunately passed away of cancer in 2020. When she went to film Clue, she had lost a lot of weight. And her family remembered that she either the production used padding or a fat suit, something like that. And when you look at the shot list of Clue, there are some notes that a take is no good because some of her padding is exposed. And so it does seem to be the case that at least something was done to beef up the cook and make her look bigger than she actually was. Let's briefly mention Lee Ving, which of course is not his real name, as they run to the front door to get rid of the key and find the motorist there. And then we'll talk about Jeffrey Kramer in a minute. Lee Ving was the lead singer of Fear, and he was really the one actor that Jonathan Lynn didn't cast. Now, this can sound as if Jonathan Lynn doesn't like him, and honestly, I have no idea if that's the case. It seems to be more that Paramount insisted on casting Lee Ving as Mr. Body because he was a very famous singer, and Paramount was trying to get singers into movie roles to boost box office sales. In fact, on the casting list of ideas, there's quite a number of singers. Rod Stewart is on there, and Mick Jagger, among others, for different roles, including Mr. Body. It went to Lee Ving, but of all the roles in Clue, it's the one that probably doesn't work as well, simply because the way Mr. Body had been written by Jonathan Lynn was very different than Lee Ving looks. Lee Ving is this big rock star, this big punk rock star. He's handsome, he's taking his shirt off on stage and having women scream for him. Well, the way Mr. Body was described in the screenplay was a really odious man. I mean, Lynn went out of his way to say he picks his nose and his teeth and other orifices. He was really meant to be this disgusting person. Jeffrey Kramer, who we just saw ushered into the lounge, was most famously in Jaws as Deputy Hendrix, but he was also in some other movies and TV series. He did have a shot at his own TV series with star uh, Jackie Lum when they did a series where Frankenstein's monster comes back from the dead. His name is Frank N. Stein. It was a pretty silly premise. The reviews were pretty brutal to the TV series, but they call out Kramer as doing a great job, just that he needed better material. This line from Colonel Mustard that two corpses, everything's fine, is really vintage Jonathan Lynn type dialogue. I'd recommend that any fan of Clue go watch at least a few episodes of Yes, Minister, and you'll get a sense of that. 
Clue moves very, very quickly and really too quickly for its own good in a lot of ways. Uh, it obviously famously flopped in theaters and critics weren't very kind to it. Now, it might be kind of overstated how much critics hated it. There were some critics that absolutely hated it, but there were also critics who liked it quite a bit and thought it was very funny. But for most critics, it was just one and a half two-star movie and they didn't say much about it or think much about it. Part of that is because so much is going on. There's a lot of layers here. There's a lot of subtle performances here. Here we can see Madeline Kahn almost losing her mind while everybody else is also yelling at one another. There's a lot of that in the movie and the lines move really fast. Most Clue fans know that Jonathan Lynn gathered the cast together in mid-May before they began shooting to watch His Girl Friday, kind of the quintessential screwball comedy from the 1930s. They watched that and then went into their rehearsals. They had one or two week of re weeks of rehearsals, something that uh, Jonathan Lynn and Deborah Hill knew was a pretty rare luxury, but thought was very important. And so on Paramount Stage 16, they set up some furniture and they went about their rehearsals. We're going to see what's set up on Paramount Stage 17 in just a few minutes here. Stage 17 was where they built the upstairs, the downstairs, and the secret passages. Those wouldn't fit here on Stage 18. You'll also notice in a minute when we go upstairs just how decrepit it is, even on the landing at the top of the stairs before they go into the bedrooms and the attic. Keep an eye out and you'll see. That was very deliberate by the production, of course, Production designer John Lloyd wanted the upstairs to be creepy and run down because the, the main floor was so sumptuous and ornate. This is a wonderful scene, and Jonathan Lynn would later remember that they got this in one take, something he was very proud of as each person comes forward to take their lots and find their partner. Now, according to the shot list, it actually took two takes, and the reason why is really remarkable. Everything went very smoothly. Christopher Lloyd got his lot, and he made his way back to his partner, Mrs. Peacock, and he purred at her, It's you and me, honey bunch, and Eileen Brennan just busted up laughing. And really, who can blame her? It's a very, very funny moment in the movie. But they did one more take, and they got it. It's really, again, fairly impressive um, work with such an ensemble of, of actors and everyone coming forward here. One of the things uh, that, that uh, set designer John Lloyd, production designer, I should say, John Lloyd, wanted was a lot of variety in the house. And that's why we have this white tiled kitchen and then we go into one room and we have orange sofas. We go into another room and there's a lot of dark wood paneling. It was probably John Lloyd who came up with the idea of the parquet floor in the hall that resembles the board game. In the script, that was supposed to be marble. In the rooms, there was supposed to be parquet flooring, but instead they went with rugs and carpet. In interviews in 1985, members of the crew talked about how the mansion was built to take a real beating. They had to drag cameras and lights around. It was very, very sturdy and well done. I want everybody to notice here that Colleen Camp still has her match, <laughs> her matchstick, and she will hold on to that until she and Michael McKean are going up the stairs and kind of bump into each other, and then she'll finally drop it. She's holding it up almost like a weapon to protect herself, and it's really, really well done. Again, we're going to cut here to the top of the stairs in this landing, and if you look around, you're going to see that it's pretty dirty up here and the walls are stained and there's a lot of dust and everything. Now, here we're still on stage 18. This upstairs was all part of the main mansion set. And then we're going to cut to stage 17 and the attic. And that includes these stairs. So now we're on a totally different sound stage on the Paramount lot. They built these stairs and the attic and everything. These weren't very large sets. They crammed them full of stuff to make them look bigger. Very old school movie stunt to make, to make things look bigger than they are, to just cram them with a lot of stuff. The upstairs and the downstairs were decorated to be as spooky and as weird as possible. And if you ever pause it, when, especially up in the attic, you will just see some wacky stuff. There's, there's stuffed reindeers up there. There's a head in a glass case. And it looks like 
a wax bust of Vladimir Lenin, of all things. Christopher Lloyd and and uh, Eileen Brennan are also on stage 17 there. This is also stage 17 now that we cut to Tim Curry and Madeline Kahn outside of the bedrooms. No other part of the movie had more cuts to it than this. They actually filmed quite a bit more footage in these upstairs and downstairs rooms, but they later trimmed it to keep the runtime down and to keep the movie going. Jonathan Lynn would later say that he regrets this. He felt like it added a lot of character to the movie. Here, especially, it's a little bit odd because Madeline Kahn is supposed to be going into a nursery and there's supposed to be an establishing shot that sweeps across the nursery and shows that they really, that, you know, this is, this is a child's room. It kind of makes it bizarre a little bit later when a jack-in-the-box pops out and we see a doll and it's not really clear what's going on. We could, of course, argue that seeing the jack-in-the-box and the creepy doll just really adds to the spookiness of the movie, and that may be, but it also can make it a little bit confusing. This is a fun shot here where the camera pans down with the actors to look under the billiard room. Again, Leslie Ann Warren and, and Martin Mull became friends on the set, and they got along really well. When they were squeezing between each other out of the bar, that took several takes. That took nine or ten takes which uh, on Clue was a lot. Now, of course, if we're, we're talking about a Stanley Kubrick production or another movie, 10 really isn't bad at all and might be considered pretty much the norm or not even very many takes. On Clue, it was. They averaged anywhere from three to four takes most of the time. But there were times when it was more. There were a couple of, of shots that ran up to 22 between the initial takes and the retakes. Here with Tim Curry in the bedroom, notice on the floor behind him, if you have a chance, that there's plaster on the ground. The room is a real mess. Here I want to take a minute to talk about the ballroom. Here we're on stage 18. We're out on bare soundstage filming through those doors of Martin Mole and Leslie Ann Warren. And then when we cut back to them and they're in the ballroom, they're many miles away in Pasadena at the Max Bush Mansion again. They shot at the Bush Mansion for one day in early August. They got those exterior shots of Tim Curry's car winding up the driveway and of the gargoyles that they'd placed on the house. And they got these two in the ballroom. This ballroom is part of that house and not part of the main set. And that's, of course, why you never see them at the same time. You never really see the doorway or them looking into it and at the end of the movie when everybody comes out after the power's out you'll see Leslie Ann Warren kind of sneak out of the doorway carefully without opening it too widely because if she had opened it the camera would have just seen bare soundstage behind her. Because of everything going on with the search of the ground floor with the motorist's car with the cop finding the motorist car with the murderer sneaking around all of this takes a while and it can lead to the idea that really uh, we see the upstairs and the downstairs a lot more than we do because everybody's separated for quite a long time, it feels like. But in reality, if you watch closely, there are really only very, very brief shots of the attic and of the upstairs bedroom and nursery. Here's those uh, clues that I was telling you about that get destroyed that were created on the, on the Paramount back lot. Now, that footage we saw just a minute ago of the cop car pulling up, that car was driven by a stunt driver. If you noticed, you might have seen that the driver's side window was rolled down so that the stunt driver could hit his mark and flip the car around. This was also shot in Franklin Canyon Drive. There's the cop also on Franklin Canyon Drive. One of the rare shots away from the Paramount lot. That was also shot at the uh, end of the shoot at the beginning of August. Here we have the motorist on the phone, and he's about to get killed. Now, the thing with this is fans over the years are familiar with the fact that the real ending is the one where everyone did it. And so we tend to picture Martin Mole doing this. He's also the only one that we see taking the key out of Wadsworth's pocket, and we also see him later in a flashback carrying the wrench across the room, ready to kill the motorist. But when this movie came out in theaters, 
it didn't show, as I'm sure most people know, all three endings at once. Instead, it showed one, and you had to pick which one you were going to go to. Those endings, by the way, got mixed up a lot. They're listed one way in the screenplay. They were listed a totally different way for when they were in theaters. Ending A was everyone did it. And then they appeared in the home video version one more way, with the last one being everyone did it. So for people who went to see ending B or ending C in the theater, well, that meant that Miss Scarlet killed the motorist or Mrs. Peacock killed the motorist. I don't know if I should give a spoiler alert here. Hopefully you've seen Clue many times before. But there was no footage or anything that was filmed of either of them doing it. It was just said that they're the ones that did it. Whereas with Martin Mull, there was actually footage shot of him killing the motorist and, of course, of taking the key out of Wadsworth's pocket. But it's important to remember in those other endings that it could have been somebody else. And it has to work for the whole movie, and we'll talk more about that and all the different endings. And those endings were what stymied most of the writers. Jonathan Lynn was really the only one to figure it out and come up with something. And now here is a pretty obvious, if you've seen the movie more than once, stunt double shot when they all crash into each other and now they're up and running back down the stairs. Those stunt doubles were used a few times. First they were used there, then there was a shot that was cut that you can see in the trailer if you go look it up online or YouTube or whatever that show them crashing again at the top of the cellar stairs just outside of where the main power switch is. But again, that shot was cut. Then I'm going to point out one more time, or a couple more times actually, where those stunt doubles appear again. Apart from the stunt drivers, they only use these stunt doubles on one day. This was all done around June 18th and June 19th, especially to drop the chandelier. That was a big day. Here you'll notice that there's a stunt double. That's uh, Her name is Cher Bryson, and she stood in for Colleen Camp. Now here's Colleen Camp back, and she hops up and fires the gun. There were no stunt doubles used for Christopher Lloyd and Michael McKean to hit the deck here. You'll also notice, if you look very closely, that Martin Mole's jacket is ripped. She did hit him with a bullet. <laughs> that was, of course, planned by the production team and done on purpose. Now, Really quickly, those are stunt doubles. Right before the chandelier falls and the camera is looking down, if you slow down and go back, you'll see stunt doubles looking kind of down a little bit so that you can't see their faces. They actually dropped the chandelier twice, and they used a two-camera setup each time to be able to get as much footage as possible. They dropped it one time with the camera up above and with the stunt doubles, and then the next day, they replaced the stunt doubles with the actors. The second time when they dropped it with the actors there, they kept the chandelier on a rope and pulley to make sure that it didn't bounce too far and hit anybody. Jonathan Lynn has said that he was really concerned about that shot and that because of John Landis's infamous Twilight Zone accident that he didn't want any accidents on Clue. And he says that it doesn't work as well, that Martin Mole was supposed to be a lot closer and almost hit by the chandelier. I think you'd probably be hard-pressed to find a fan that thought, oh, that didn't work, he should have been closer. It, it seems to work just fine. But Jonathan Lynn had an idea of what he wanted, and since he didn't feel like he was able to do it, perhaps he's being a little bit more critical of himself. Here we have Bill Henderson. Bill Henderson was a famous jazz singer, and he was actually friends with Bill Cosby, who he'd met in the 1960s. It might be hard or even weird to imagine now, but throughout the 1960s, there were Playboy clubs throughout the country. Uh, yes, as in Playboy men's entertainment magazine and those playboy clubs were very popular and they held stand they had stand-up comedians and they had uh, musical acts and that's where bill henderson met bill cosby bill cosby told bill henderson hey move out to los angeles get into movies and henderson eventually did this year alone in 1985 when he was in clue he was also in three other things a couple of tv shows and another movie here, Yvette is trying not to be noticed by the cop because he knows who she is. She works in Miss Scarlet's bordello, and the cop gets bribed there. But again, as I pointed out earlier, there's really no effort made 
to explain why the cop and Miss Scarlet pretend not to know each other. We can imagine in one case, but maybe not the other, although the cop isn't supposed to be taking bribes, and so maybe the idea is that he's not going to say anything either. Regardless, he's Miss Scarlet's informant. Here you'll notice those fake cardboard books on the library door rattle a bit. It's hard to make everything work in a movie, and they couldn't put real books on those doors or they would be weighed down too much. With the cop locked up in the library, he was originally supposed to answer the phone, and when he finds out it's J. Edgar Hoover, he was supposed to say, Yeah, right, and I'm Harry Truman. And in another draft of the script, he was supposed to say, Yeah, right, and I'm the Pope. That was obviously dropped and not used in the final film. Now here as they clean this up, we might ask why Wadsworth bothers to sweep up the gun. That'll be important later when he points out that the gun is missing. And they choose to put all of the uh, debris from the chandelier in one pile under, under that chandelier. In another draft, there was also something about the key and how the murderer was able to get around the house so easily with this key. And Wadsworth finds it discarded in a potted plant. That was obviously abandoned too, and none of that was ever filmed. This is a wonderful moment, and it's why I chose to call my book, What Do You Mean Murder? I really like this spot with everybody together, gathered around, looking on, kind of pretending to be as baffled as possible. In two of the endings that we're going to see later, they explain why J. Edgar Hoover was calling, but in two other endings, they did, again, remember, filmed for... They filmed four, they edited four, and they planned to go to theaters with four endings. And I'll talk about what happened a little later. But in two of those endings, they never explained why on earth J. Edgar Hoover would be calling Hill House. Now, of course, today, people might have to go do a quick Google search for who he was and why the joke might be funny, including Wadsworth's later joke. He cleans up messes because his name is Hoover. That's a very British joke because, in, of course, in England, they don't vacuum, they Hoover. One of the main changes between the first and second draft was Jonathan Lynn updating his British English to American English. In the first draft, he talks about how Colonel Mustard picked up a torch. And then in the second draft, that obviously becomes a flashlight. This upcoming part is really an amazing bit of dark comedy. A lot of people that are so familiar with Clue and used to it probably don't give it much thought, but it is wild to have these characters in a PG-rated family movie kissing corpses and pretending that these corpses are alive. It's very funny and it's very, very well done. There's an unreleased publicity still of Madeline Kahn sitting up after she's been kissing leaving or Mr. Body and she just looks dazed as if what have I done with my life you know what what has my life become again these are leaving and Kelly Nakahara they really kept these actors around to play these corpses they didn't use dummies or stand-ins or anything like that and so they were actually on set a lot more than people might realize and they have some good stories about Clue. Leaving, for whatever reason, has rarely chosen to speak about Clue. One exception is he appears in Jeff Smith's Who Done It? The Clue documentary, which is a really fun documentary, and any fan should go see it immediately. But Leaving has, for whatever reason, again, chosen not to speak much about Clue. Kelly Nakahara was really never asked about Clue. I would have loved to have interviewed her. Instead, I was fortunate enough to interview her daughter and, and her husband, and they were wonderful and told me some stories of Clue, including coming and visiting the set and being really blown away by how it truly was just like a real house. They said you, you wouldn't really notice the difference, and it was just so fun to run around. There are some other stories about families being on the Clue set. This was probably on a press day. The, day the, the Friday before filming began, filming began on Monday, May 20th, 1985. The Friday before, on May 17th, the press were invited to the set. And all the cast were there in costume. And Peter Goober and John Peters, two, are the, two of the producers, and, and uh, Deborah Hill were also there, and Jonathan Lynn were there. And they did interviews with the press, and there was footage taken that you can actually go see now, if you go look for it, by Entertainment Tonight. 
And that's when that happened. And that's probably when some families were there. There's another article that talks about a report that the where a reporter goes to talk to Michael McKean and he ends up giving away the pool cue to a kid who happens to be on the set. Here they're splitting up to go search the house again. This was right before the July 4th holiday. This is on July 3rd, and they filmed that shot of everyone going up the stairs, and then they filmed this of Martin Mole and Leslie Ann Warren searching the kitchen, and then they would break for the July 4th holiday, and when they came back, the power goes out, and they film the murder. Or, I should say, the murderers. Here, Leslie Ann Warren and Martin Mull were supposed to be filmed running down this secret passage. Again, the secret passages were on stage 17, nearby stage 18. That was also cut. One of John Landis's original visions was that Clue was supposed to take place in real time. Everything was supposed to happen in the hour and a half or so that the movie takes place. That idea was kept mostly in spirit, but if you watch the movie closely, you can see there are a handful of cuts where there's a time jump, where, for example, someone is leaving the kitchen to go to the library, and next thing you know, they're in the library, and so we obviously lose a few seconds there. Many of those moments of people walking from one room to the other were filmed, but then they were later cut in editing. Here the power goes out again. That could be one of four hands doing that, depending on who the murderer or murderers is. This is the part that fans have taken online to perhaps criticize the most. It's pretty hard for some of these people to have committed these murders, especially, of course, that one with Madeline Kahn. We see Mrs. White screaming, and we hear her screams as Yvette comes down the stairs and makes her way to the billiard room, and then, at least in one of the endings... Yvette's supposed to be killed by Madeline Kahn. Here, as Colleen Camp walks towards the uh, camera, she ditches her fake French accent. It's easy to miss. And again, that's kind of what I mean when I said earlier that Clue is really doing too much at once. It's a wonderful movie, but it's really not all that surprising that critics didn't necessarily love it or get it when it first came out. It takes multiple viewings to really appreciate but for those of us that have fallen in love with it over the years, that's what makes it even better. For this, they took several shots to get this right of the pipe coming up to hit the cop. Jonathan Lynn did something not all that dissimilar to what Sidney Lumet did for Murder on the Orient Express. He took shots of the murders and then he stepped back and took them from different angles to show what really happened. In Murder on the Orient Express, Sidney Lumet took footage of characters explaining things, and then he put on different lenses and used different angles and had those characters repeat the same thing so that when the ending is explained, they have a different take of the character saying something. Here, this is an example of some of the changes to the script that went through. In one of the early preliminary drafts that Jonathan Lynn first wrote, when Tim Curry ends up in the shower, he yells, at, he's supposed to yell out, I'm in the fucking shower. Lynn would later cut out that kind of profanity just because, again, that was part of Parker Brothers' arrangement. Here, everyone comes out again. There's Leslie Ann Warren. She's just emerged from the ballroom, but there's no ballroom back there. And so she was careful about the door. This is, again, another wonderful scene and a big favorite of fans as they wander around just dazed and not all that shocked to find these dead bodies. In the next room, in the library, Michael McKean will be the only one really stunned to see the cop. A quick mention of the singing telegram girl and Jane Weedlin. The original idea for the singing telegram was that her car would make its way up the long driveway and we'd see it coming just as we saw the cop approaching when his car found the motorist car and that kind of thing. The singing telegram girl was supposed to find the dummy that was out with the rifle guarding the guests, and then she was supposed to knock it over, and that's how we were supposed to know it was a dummy. That was in the early drafts before Jonathan Lynn came up with the dogs. Jane Weedlin was the rhythm guitarist for the Go-Go's, and she was very famous, of course, already because of that. And again, this is part of this 
thing that happened in the 80s where movie studios wanted to make singers and rock stars big actors. Clue was her first movie, but she's since gone on to do several other movies, especially as a voiceover artist. She continues to do voiceover work today. With Wadsworth's explanation of what happened, and this is a lot of fans' favorite part of the movie, there came a big shift in production. Up until now, the production had, again, mostly, not entirely though, followed the chronology of the movie. Here, they would split that. It really makes no sense and is just not at all economical to film Wadsworth running into the kitchen here as he does for five seconds, if that, and then turn around and run out. It would take hours to set up this shot just to get everybody running in and then running back out. Instead, what they did was they started filming room by room out of order. And so even though there would be multiple scenes in the study of them running in and running out and coming and going, they set up and filmed everything all at once in the study. Then they set up and filmed everything all at once in the dining room. And then they went to the library and so on. They waited until the end of the shoot to film everything that was left in the hall. So when we see Wadsworth explaining things in the hall that was filmed about the second half of July and they took about two weeks to get all of that for um, his explanations here and then also for the four endings. Now that gets trickier not only with filming but also with costumes and what the actors have to remember and it could be very confusing especially keeping in mind that there are four endings and Jonathan Lynn would have to step in and say hey this is what we're doing. You know, it's always hard to know what to believe in the press when it comes to a Hollywood film. These movies cost millions of dollars. There's a lot on the line and everybody puts on a really good face to make it seem as if everything's going smoothly and everything is wonderful. In my research, I have no reason to believe that everything that happened on Clue really didn't go pretty smoothly. It would, did fall behind schedule by, a, by about nine days and that's about it. Everybody really did seem to get along. So when there's quotes in the press from 1985 with the actors talking about how much they appreciate Jonathan Lynn and how well they got along with him and what a good job he did, I'm inclined to believe it. I don't think it was just posturing. I think they appreciated him. And I think they appreciated the fact that everything went kind of smoothly. In fact, years later, Christopher Lloyd was being interviewed and he was asked about Clue. He couldn't even remember Jonathan Lynn's name. Now, while that might seem a little bit silly, it just goes to show this guy's done a ton of movies. <laughs> and this was a long time ago. And it probably speaks to something that the, the fact that he couldn't remember Lynn's name, it probably means that everything went pretty smoothly. Now we might ask ourselves, in one of the endings, Wadsworth was gone when Mrs. Peacock got slapped. He had snuck down the secret passage for the fourth ending. So how on earth did he reenact that part? Well, not everything in Clue is perfect. Today, fans really demand a consistent mythology, but that just wasn't the case in 1985, and no one probably would have really noticed that kind of thing. And again, filmmakers then and earlier could never have imagined fans queuing up a high-definition Blu-ray and pausing scenes and going out of their way to try and find out what's going on. Fandom has certainly changed since 1985. Today we have geek culture and people who obsessively track this kind of stuff, but that just wasn't the case then. There's that case of birds there to suggest the animal decor that Tommy Roisden wanted. That painting is of President William McKinley. He was assassinated in 1901 and his vice president was Theodore Roosevelt and that's how Theodore Roosevelt first became president. It may be that his painting was included here in Clue because he was assassinated and it kind of keeps up, keeps up with the themes of murder. The other two portraits in the room are of George Washington behind the cast there. And then the other one was of James A. Garfield, also a president who was assassinated. Now, these paintings were created by the production team and they were based on real paintings. The Washington painting is especially hard to identify. It seems to be an amalgamation of, of two or three different paintings. But the other two, the McKinley painting 
and the uh, Garfield painting, it's pretty easy to identify where they come from. They don't look exactly like the originals because again, they were just being copied by the production team to make sure they have the right size and get everything what they need. While Wadsworth continues to explain what happened, let's talk for a moment about John Morris and his score. He was contacted early on by Jonathan Lynn to record the score. They didn't know each other, but John Morris was recommended to Jonathan Lynn, and he wrote him and asked him if he would be interested, and John Morris said he would. Morris would get to work on the score for the music after principal photography wrapped in August of 1985. He ended up recording the score at the end, towards the end of October. It was October 21st through the 24th. He recorded it on the Paramount lot um, in a now demolished studio that was used to be able to record movie scores. Morris's score is really phenomenal and it stands out even now to a lot of fans. It's doing a lot at once. It's playful, but it's also kind of sinister and he really, really nails it. Morris was most famously known for composing Mel Brooks's movies. He did things like Young Frankenstein and Spaceballs and a lot of other stuff. Morris really was able to walk that fine line of celebrating and parodying. And he's rightly really respected and renowned for his work. The Clue score wasn't originally released with the movie. That's something that is important to understand about Clue and makes it challenging to write about Clue and to know exactly what happened. Because Clue wasn't a big success, in fact it was a flop, everybody involved in it went on to other work pretty quickly. And in the case of some of the actors and the creators, they were anxious to put it behind them. Not because they were necessarily ashamed of it, but in Hollywood you're only as good as your last movie. And it can really affect your career. And it did affect Jonathan Lynn's career. He wasn't able to direct for several years after Clue. And then the first time he did direct, it was Nuns on the Run, and it was for a small production company in Great Britain that later, after Nuns on the Run, went bankrupt. His next movie after that was My Cousin Vinny, and that's probably his most well-known and most respected movie, although maybe not among Clue fans. Because of the fact that Clue wasn't much of a success, there wasn't really any chance for it to take a victory lap. There wasn't a lot of going around on talk shows and celebrating the success. There was really no reason for any of the stars to keep a lot of props or remember anything about it. And because of that, the cast is kind of defaulted to telling a lot of the same stories. For my book, I reached out and was able to interview a few people. But for my book, I very deliberately didn't want to rely on interviews because I noticed most of the same stories being shared across articles. And that's very normal, and I don't want to hit the cast for that or anything because that's just what they remember about the movie. It's easy, again, for fans who love something to get really wrapped up in something, but fans cannot have the same connection to a movie that the people who worked on it do. The people who worked on the movie were working, and it was hard work at times. And for them, it was one thing out of many that they've done, one project out of many, and they would go on. And so today, for example, when people ask Jonathan Lynn, well, what was in the fourth ending? And he says, I don't know. He's not being deceptive <laughs> or shady. He really doesn't remember. And in fact, until very recently, he didn't even have a copy of the script that would have shown him what the fourth ending was. In 2017, Jonathan Lynn got together with writer and director Josh Brandon, and Josh Brandon had Lynn record an audio commentary for Clue. Now, before you go look at your Blu-ray trying to find it, it's not on there. It was actually recorded as a special episode for Kevin Smith's podcast, and it's only available if you get a subscription to Smith's podcast. It's definitely worth hearing if you can find it, but... Even on that, about an hour into the movie, Jonathan Lynn doesn't have a lot more to add. He just doesn't remember a lot. And it's not, again, because he doesn't appreciate the, the fact that fans like Clue. It was just, for him, it was a very, very diff different situation. It's important to remember that for Jonathan Lynn, Clue was a work for hire. This wasn't some passion project that he labored on for years. And in fact, before he was hired for it, he thought it was ridiculous. 
He's spoken openly both in 1985 and more recently about that. He says that he just thought this was the dumbest thing he'd ever heard. He couldn't believe these people were reaching out to him to write a movie based on a board game. Well, they got to him and they intrigued him enough that he agreed to do it. But again, it wasn't something that he was looking to do. And so he spent several months and even when you think about writing the screenplays, years of his life working on this. He worked very, very hard. It was a new thing for him to be able to do. And then when the movie came out, well, it bombed. And that was hard for him and for his career. Fortunately, he was able to just go back to England and jump into the next series of Yes Minister and go back to the theater and keep on working. I'm going to jump in here for just a minute and talk about Howard Hessman. Hessman was credited as the elderly evangelist. He was meant to be kind of a cameo role. In fact, early on, a few roles were envisioned as cameos, and they pictured big stars coming in to do them, things like the cook and the motorist and the evangelist. Hessman was the only one they got that audiences would have really recognized. Obviously, Kelly Nakahara as the cook was recognizable from MASH, but not because she was a big star. Hessman was recognizable because he was Dr. Johnny Fever on WKRP in Cincinnati. He agreed to do the movie on condition that his name not appear anywhere in the credits. It's not clear if Hessman was just trying to go along with the idea of it being a cameo role, but not being credited got him out of any kind of promotional duties like going on talk shows or anything like that. All right, here we are in the first ending, so we should jump back and quickly talk about these endings. They were dreamed up by Jonathan Lynn. They were not figured out by John Landis at that point, and so he's the one that came up with these. This first one really makes the most sense. It's Miss Scarlet and Yvette did it, and it was also a favorite of Paramount's when Lynn first submitted the script, and one of the script readers suggested that if they're going to only use one ending, this be the one. And it works best because of the reasons Wadsworth explains. And you'll note that in this ending, this is the one that Wadsworth does go to the most lengths to explain why it works. He explains that Miss Scarlet was on the ground floor and that she knew about the secret passages because Yvette told her something that isn't explained in other endings. In fact, in Jonathan Lynn's commentary, when Josh Brandon asks him, hey, how did Colonel Mustard know about the, sec the secret passage? Jonathan Lynn replied, I don't know. Now we might ask ourselves, wait a second, if Yvette worked for Miss Scarlet and she worked as a prostitute or a sex worker, then why would she know about the secret passages? She wasn't really a maid at Hill House. But overall, this ending does work best. The others are a little bit tricky, especially when we have to consider that people like Mrs. Peacock or Mrs. White had to make their way upstairs or downstairs and then get back where they were, especially when the way the film is cut and edited shows them standing in exactly the same place they were before and after a murder. It seems a little unlikely. All right, let's get into that fourth ending before we run out of time. The fourth ending was The Butler Did It, Wadsworth poisoned all of the characters at the beginning using the champagne and he's convinced that he has to pull off the perfect murder. It's a little bizarre frankly. He says that he was moved by perfection his whole life and he wanted to commit the perfect murder. In the first draft Wadsworth wasn't motivated by perfection. He was just trying to take over Mr. Body's business and actually it works better in my opinion than what they came up with. They did go to great lengths to film that fourth ending. In fact, in some of the takes, after Wadsworth is confronted, he tries to frame Mrs. Peacock and Professor Plum. They even put him on roller skates, and he's running around the mansion and as if he's gliding on roller skates. And they filmed all of that. In the end, Wadsworth gets caught by the evangelist, and he tricks everyone. He says, I'm going to show you how it was all done. And then he runs out of the mansion and locks the front door and locks everyone in. Well, they filmed everyone breaking through the conservatory glass. And they set up two cameras to get it. And one of the cameras was filming in slow motion to kind of dramatize the breaking glass. And then Wadsworth gets in a police car and drives away, thinking he's got away with it. 
and then he hears snarling and snapping in the back seat. And the final shot was a point of view shot from Wadsworth's perspective of the dogs rising up in the seat to attack him. So that's the fourth ending. Well, what happened? It was shot, it was edited, it was ready to go. In September 1985, Jonathan Lynn put together a cut for test audiences. Michael McDowell, who would go on to write the novelization for Clue, was able to come to Paramount Studios in September, in early September, it was September 4th, 1985, to view rough footage of Clue to help him write the novel. And when he got there that day, Jonathan Lynn was actually adding a soundtrack, a temporary soundtrack, to the footage that he had assembled for test audiences. And so after that, throughout September, Clue was screened to test audiences. So there are people out there who in September 1985 saw the fourth ending of Clue. Those test audiences scored that fourth ending pretty poorly, <laughs> and that's why it was ultimately dropped. Jonathan Lynn's spoken about how he regrets splitting up the three endings for the theatrical release of Clue. The whole point of having three or originally four endings is to show the cleverness of the script. And Jonathan Lynn's exactly right. And in fact, at the time, there were critics who said so. One of the critics for the Los Angeles Times said the best version of Clue is one you're not going to see. Critics had all three endings screened for them back to back, and so they were able to see everything. And the whole point for these critics that said this was that, hey, what makes it funny and what makes it interesting as a parody of a murder mystery is to show just how easy it is to change whoever the murderer is. Here in the next ending, we have Mrs. Peacock did it. This one is probably the least favorite among fans, and it's pretty simple, although I will point out that Eileen Brennan is positively delicious here. She goes from being this kind of hysterical, nervous woman to being really cold and calculating. It's a wonderful performance. Quickly jumping back to that deleted fourth ending, all that's ever been released are a few still images from it. I found some in my research of Clue, and I've put those on my Instagram page. If you go look up Clue Book One on Instagram, you'll find that. Paramount has been rather strange about the fourth ending. They haven't taken any opportunity to release it on a special edition Blu-ray or anything, or even do a theatrical re-release. You have to think they'd make a ton of money if they did that, but they don't seem to be interested. There are other still images, mostly from what Paramount released as a storybook. It might sound funny to have a storybook for a movie that is just teeming with sexual innuendo and murder, but it was very common in the 1980s to release a novelization in a storybook. The idea was that fans would get these, and they were often released before the movie was even out. The reason for that was people would see it in grocery stores or bookstores and think to go see the movie. But you have to remember, at the time, if somebody bought the novelization of Clue, well, it's not like they had Twitter to go share the ending of the movie. And so, while there were some spoiler-averse things going on, Deborah Hill didn't want reporters, for example, to know the ending of Clue because they did have a lot of readers that they could broadcast it to, there just weren't the same concerns then as there are today because it just wasn't possible for someone to go blab all over the place what the ending was. So some of those still images from the fourth ending come from the Clue storybook. There is some footage of the fourth ending available online. It's a blink and you miss it moment from one of the commercials where you hear Professor Plum say, what has it got to do with me? That's actually from the fourth ending. You can go look up the Clue commercials on YouTube. The three TV spots for Clue all ran 30 seconds, and they all had a narrator racing through the names of the characters, the weapons, and the rooms. They really wanted to tie it to the game, since that's what most people were familiar with. I want you to pay very close attention to this next scene outside, again, put outside in quotes. This is still on Paramount Stage 18. The evangelist is going to confront Mrs. Peacock, and they're going to have kind of this showdown where he draws his gun, and then there's an immediate cut to floodlights coming on and the police racing in, and we hear Mrs. Peacock's voice off screen. Well, that's because as originally filmed, 
the evangelist guns down Mrs. Peacock. Everyone comes out and the chief says, Wadsworth, we got her. Well, that's left in the film, but Jonathan Lynn decided during test screenings that this was a bit much. So if you pay close attention here, you realize that we don't see Mrs. Peacock again because she's dead, but they resurrect her and she's still alive and instead she's just arrested. Now this quick moment here with everyone slapping Mr. Green was added during filming. It wasn't part of the original screenplay. Jonathan Lynn actually discouraged ad-libbing, and so there aren't many moments in the movie that aren't in the screenplay, but it occasionally happened, and this is one of those times. Now we come to the final ending. Here's what really happened. As I mentioned, most of these endings were shot at the end of July. They went from about July 15th to July 31st. Some of the footage was shot earlier in some of the different rooms, but everything in the hall was shot then. To give you a brief overview of the timeline of Shooting Clue, they began on May 20th and they filmed everyone arriving and they filmed everything in the library and then they went into the dining room and by then we're getting into June. Then they go into the study and they film everything in there and go around the mansion and everybody searching everything and all of that. By the time we get to July, we're to that second time when the power goes off and then they go to Wadsworth explaining everything. And that was all filmed in kind of early and mid-July as well. And then by the time we get to mid and the end of July, they're doing everything in the hall to film these four endings. The things that were shot in August were all on stage 17. So when they filmed those upstairs and downstairs scenes, that's when that was done. Those were not filmed in order at all. They filmed the stuff in Franklin Canyon Drive, so that would be Miss Scarlet's car breaking down and Professor Plum picking her up and Wadsworth's car making its way to the gates of Hill House and also the cop finding the motorist car. They filmed one more thing in Franklin Canyon Drive in, the, in August, around August 5th or August 6th, and that was the motorist approaching the house. They had whole footage of him driving and then a cat running across the road, and that's what makes him swerve and run off the road. But they cut all of that. All right, we're to the moment, as Adam Vary calls it in his oral history. Flames on the side of my face. They did two takes of this. Madeline Kahn also rehearsed it this way, and that's what got everyone laughing so much and deciding to go with it. It was not in the script. It's one of the very few moments that's ad-libbed. And that's why you have those reaction shots of Martin Mull and Christopher Lloyd looking at each other like, this is crazy. That wasn't originally scripted either. They did that because Madeline Kahn's rehearsal was so funny and they did the two takes. Originally, Jonathan Lynn thought, well, maybe we should do it as it was originally written, which was, yes, I killed her, I hated her. But Khan was so funny that they just went with it. And they used the second take in the final movie. This ending where Wadsworth turns out to be Mr. Body is a favorite of fans, but it, boy, it sure raises a lot of questions, not least of which is why was his butler pretending to be Mr. Body, especially given all of the abuse that he was taking and the danger he was putting himself in. But that's okay. Not everything needs to be perfect, and Clue is more loved as a comedy than a mystery anyway. This was also shot at the end of July. This is actually a very nice shot of Wadsworth walking in front of everybody, and we glimpse the back of their heads. All of the characters are doing some nice background work from time to time. In fact, earlier in the first ending, when Wadsworth and Scarlet are arguing over how many bullets are left in the gun, if you look, you can see the characters in the background adding up and doing the math on their hands. You know, one plus two plus two plus one. This moment took a few tries to get. Tim Curry's prop gun misfired a few times. And so this took several takes to get right with Michael McKean drawing his gun and firing on Wadsworth. Again, keeping in mind that the camera is cutting back and forth, and so they're shooting everything with Wadsworth first, and then they're setting up again to get McKean and the other actors in the background, and then that would all be cut in later in editing. But for Tim Curry, it was a little bit tricky to get his gun to actually work. Here we have McKean becoming the hero, and he's no longer Mr. Green. He is 
an FBI agent. He's going to let in the cavalry, so to speak, and save the day. His last line, of course, is a fan favorite. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. And with that, thank you for joining me for this audio commentary of Clue. I've spoken fast and we've bounced around a lot trying to cover as much as possible, and we've really only scratched the surface. There's a lot more to this movie than a lot of people realize. Once again, I'm the author of What Do You Mean Murder? Clue and the Making of a Cult Classic. I do hope you'll go look for the book so you can learn so much more about this amazing movie. Thanks for joining me.